So since we just spoke of that, I'll do I'll mention it too. Yes, it is recording. Thank you. <laughs> oh, okay. Super. All right. So everybody should be able to see my slides. We're going to go back and forth between the slides and um, our studio to do some of this together. But uh, our markdown, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is this, uh, basically, it's a set of tools. It's an R package, but it's a set of tools. And it's really ultimately a lifestyle that's a way of combining uh, your R code that you're using for your data analysis or what have you with text. Um, so prose the way that you would write in Word or whatever your, your word processor is or text processor is. And you can combine those two together to create output that is, uh, that is directly linked right back to your data and to your code. So it's a way of um, sort of keeping track of the decisions you make in your writing process along the way. Um, it also makes your uh, your final writing product very reproducible because if you update your results, for example, let's say you have a data set um, and you write up the results, but then you decide to run a couple of more participants for that, uh, that experiment. And so you ha now have five new participants. You can basically just rerun your, uh, your R markdown file, presuming, presumably that you did your data analysis in R, and you can update your results in your, in your writing, your written document. Um, in a way that makes it very easy to track and see how things have changed over time. And so um, it's just incredibly powerful. Um, and like I said, I'm using it for everything. Pretty much all of my writing is now done in R Markdown just because it became so accessible. That's the other thing that's really nice about it is it's very accessible in a way that some other um, powerful uh, writing and text processing tools are not. So I had originally tried, I had started out in LaTeX. Um, LaTeX I know is really, uh, big in linguistics and in psychology, and I was trying to um, to use LaTeX for all of my writing, but it was just like I wasn't spending enough time really learning, really thinking about the writing. I was thinking about formatting and troubleshooting and this and that and the other. Um, and so once I discovered our markdown, it was sort of just like a light bulb went off. I was like, oh, this is actually much easier to learn than things that I've tried to learn in the past. Um, so. This is just a graphical representation of sort of the magic of our markdown. Um, this is by an illustrator and our user named Allison Horst. She is wonderful. If you have not heard of her, uh, I'll have a link to her in this slide. She has some really, really fantastic science communication illustrations specific to, um, to R. So you'll, you'll see her illustrations crop up every once in a while. Uh, so today, what we're going to do is we've got this uh, presentation of that's going to cover the basics. And we're going to do a lot of hands-on stuff, as I said, uh, starting with using our projects to create a project directory for any new um, writing project that we're setting out for ourselves. Then we're going to create, edit, and compile uh, an R markdown file. And then we'll also scale up and learn how you can actually use a regular R script in combination with an R markdown file to do um, some more powerful things. Um, and to just be a little bit more modular in your analyses. Uh, and then we'll see where, where that leaves us. So here's another Alice and Horace comic for you to start us off. And I like this because this is just a reminder of uh, learning in our R journey. So this is um, our R learning process over time, right? So when you start out, you feel like you know absolutely nothing. You learn a little bit and you're like, oh, I actually know a lot. And then at some point you're going to just there's this whole chasm of stuff you don't know. And so then you feel like you know nothing. But it's this happens over and over and over again. And at some, at some point, it becomes a little bit less anxiety inducing. And I like this uh, tweet interaction here um, because it is true. The funniest thing is that this can be like a couple of minutes or a day, or it can be like five years. And so this is very much the last like five years for me is this up and down and up and down. Um, but I just want to put that out there as a, well, we're going to cover a lot of new stuff for many people, I think, today, and that's okay. Um, there's a lot more to learn, but that's also okay. We're all just figuring it out together, and you just kind of learn the things you need to learn as you go and um, take it from there. Okay, so our basic set of tools um, are, in addition to our markdown, right, which is this package designed to do the things I've mentioned and what we're talking about today, we also um, have the tools that are available to us through the R Studio interface, um, which I think a lot of people probably use these days. Not everybody uses it. You can use R Markdown without it, but it, R Studio has a lot of uh, capabilities that make 
our markdown much easier. So I highly recommend uh, using our studio if you're not already. And then of course we are using R, the programming language itself, um, which is uh, which is basically the engine for our studio. So just a quick refresher of what we're looking at in our studio so that we are all on the same um, uh, same plane going forward. When you open up our studio, you have by default these four different panes and you can rearrange where your panes look and, and um, whether they're showing or not. But basically the ones that we're going to be uh, interested in right now are our source code. So that's going to be where we're um, adding to our script, our, our markdown file, our R file. Um, and then the console uh, pane is where you can actually run code and see printouts, warnings, messages, et cetera. Uh, and then there's the this additional pane where you can see uh, variables in your environment, you can see files in your working directory, and our viewer pane is down here where you can see figures. Um, and some people, when we compile our, our markdown document, the output we're going to compile, uh, and for many people, it may pop right up in the viewer pane. So that'll be where that goes, but you can we can toggle that. And just so you know, I've got my RStudio um, open as well. So we're going to go be going back and forth. And just a quick little um, contextual point of interest. So this presentation was written using R Markdown. So that's what you're looking at right here is it's just the R Markdown source code for the presentation. Um, and I'll show you a little bit more if you're interested in what that looks like. But that's just another application of what you can do with R Markdown. Uh, okay, so our markdown uh, necessitates a little bit of knowledge about markdown itself. And markdown re really refers to a, a very simple syntax that allows you to um, add simple tags to basically plain text to modify it. So it was originally designed to be an easier, more accessible language alternative to HTML text. Uh, it's, I find it to be a lot easier to learn and a lot easier to read when you're typing, which is really great. So it means that you can do a lot of your writing in the source code and still read what you're trying to type, which is very different from, for example, LaTeX or HTML, um, et cetera. So it is really designed to be this sort of minimalist writing system. Um, so this is just a little image of what markdown text looks like. You can write markdown outside of R markdown. It's just what the syntax that R markdown uses. But for example, um, if you have ever used GitHub, like readmes on GitHub are written using um, a specific flavor of markdown syntax that's used all over the place. Um, but it's very, very straightforward to learn. So we'll look at some cheat sheets related to that and do a little bit more digging in that. But I've also linked here um, just a couple of resources for learning the basics of Markdown as well, which you can check out afterwards. So then our Markdown, like we said, is this way to use Markdown syntax uh, combined with our code to create these outputs that are very closely linked together. It's also a way that allows for integration with your reference management software. Um, it allows really reproducible documents. And as I've said, I think it's a very accessible learning curve. So this is going to be sort of our goal output today. Create an R Markdown document. We're going to read in uh, the simulated data that I provided, um, and we're going to create uh, an R Markdown summary document. So like I said, there's lots of different outputs that you can do. Our goal for today, and, and a good starting place, I think, for learning R Markdown is um, uh, thinking, thinking of using it as a way to do some basic communication, of, like a summarizing of your data. So this is something I think I started out using our markdown to communicate um, just interim findings to my PhD supervisor when I was writing my dissertation. Um, I would have sometimes stats consults um, and I would just need to give them a little snapshot of, of what the problem was or what my question was. And so I would create a little summary document in our markdown to show um, to the biostats department, whoever I was meeting with my consult, uh, at my consultation, but then you can scale up from there. So, so this is going to be our starting point today. All right, so we're going to get started with some hands-on stuff with our basics. Like I said, we're going to start with our projects. So um, I don't know, those of you who have your cameras on, are you, can you do a head nod or a head shake? Is anybody using our projects already? Is this something seeing? Yeah, okay. Some yes and some no, super. So our projects are just a really nice way, great to 
um, to keep all your code together, basically it creates kind of a snapshot of where you left off. So whenever I start a new project, like a new writing project, a new data analysis project, whatever, I create a new R project. That's my first step. It's really nice because once you close R Studio, if you reopen your project file, it creates a very specific file, it'll pick up with all the tabs you had open. Um, it'll, in some cases, you can have it pick up your environment where you left off. And so if you have multiple different projects on the go, it's very nice to have separate R projects because you're not losing kind of your place. So we're gonna do this together. Um, if you have R Studio open, feel free to follow along. We're gonna just go up to file, new project. And what I would like you to do is just somewhere on your local drive, uh, create a new directory for this workshop. And we're, well, you, can, you can copy and paste the contents of the folder that you had access to. So our toy data set and the R and R markdown file. Just copy and paste those right into that directory. And um, we'll, we'll create a project based on that directory. So we can follow along. I'm going to do this as well. So I have, like I said, I have a RStudio project open for this presentation right now, but I'm going to create a new project with you. So file, new project. OK, and I already have, let's see, is this, I'll just show you. So in my desktop, I already created this empty folder that's called our markdown intro. It has nothing in it right now. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and just copy. I'm just going to copy the, the data, that CSV file from the folder that you would have downloaded. And I'm just going to copy that right into my R markdown intro folder. Oops. And now this is the directory that I'm going to use for my R project. So I made a new project. I'm going to click existing directory because the folder that I want already exists. I'm going to find it. It's just on my desktop, our markdown. So you just click right into that, select that. And then I'm going to click open a new session. Um, great. Yes. Thanks, Sophie. Uh, so this will create a new RStudio session, a new project session. So I don't lose my place with the, with the other one I had open. Okay, so I'll just move that over so you can see it. So it's a totally new project. Everything is empty because there's nothing in it yet. We haven't done anything. But you can see now in my folder, there's this new um, .rproj file. So if I were to quit this session, next time I wanted to open it up, I just double click that R project file and it'll open up everything where I left off. I have two monitors going, so I just got to drag it, but. Okay, so step one, we created our, our project. Everybody good to go with that? Super, okay. So best practice, just start off with a project for anything new that you're working on. Okay, next we're going to create our very first R Markdown document, or maybe not your very first if you've done this before. But uh, the way that we do this is we go to file, uh, new file, R Markdown. And there's a bunch of templates that are available and you can download packages for other kinds of templates. Um, but we're just going to create one based on the default template and we're not really gonna change anything and we're gonna try doing what's called knitting it right away. So um, when we compile the code, when we compile the source document into the final output, that process in our markdown is called knitting. So uh, knitter is another package that underlies the R markdown package. And that's, that's basically the engine for doing this conversion process. So you can think of like knitting your code with your text together, like knitting a sweater. Um, so when I say knit, that's what I'm referring to. So let's create this new R markdown file. We're gonna give it a useful title and we're gonna save it in the project folder that we just made. And then we are going to compile it and it should pop up with something um, totally readable. So new file. Our markdown. Uh, I'm not even going to give it a title. You can give yours a title. Well, we'll just say test. Uh, just keep all the defaults selected. You can also, just so you know, you can create an empty document um, when you're starting out something. I honestly usually still use the default template and just modify it because it sets up some stuff uh, that we're going to learn about that's really useful that I don't like to set up on my own if I can avoid it. 
So we'll create this. It has popped up in our source pane. It is currently called untitled and we're going to uh, save it. And yep, it's still right in my project folder. So I'm just gonna call it, I'm just gonna call it untitled, which is bad practice, but just for the sake of demonstration, this is my untitled R markdown file. So there's a lot of stuff in here. We're gonna go over this, but what I wanna draw your attention to is right now it has the title that I gave it and my name and the date uh, that I created it, um, as well as the format that we're going to compile to the output format. All of that is sort of created for us at the beginning. This is a section of code, a special section of code for our Markdown documents called YAML. We'll talk about that later on, but you should be able to, um, without really knowing too much else about this document, knit it. So if you're working in RStudio, there's a little button right up here. And if you just click that button, it will knit to whatever the um, default specified output is. So let's everybody try to do that and see what we get. And if you have, even a relatively recent version of our studio, like in the last couple of years, it should just compile uh, just like this, like it did for me, and it creates this nice HTML document. So just get a vibe check on that, some head nods from people, great. Uh, sorry to interrupt, someone is mentioning that she, they sorry, missed a step to create the markdown. Yeah, I'll just show you that again. So if you go up to, File, new file, our markdown. And then you can just leave all the defaults as they are for you um, and hit okay. And that'll create exactly what we have here. It'll just have a different name and title potentially. And then I think I see a hand, Beth. Yeah, hi, I was just wondering when I've done this in the past, I've always created an R notebook. So in that, you know, rather than going to when new file, rather than going to our markdown, going to our notebook. And it looks very much like this is, can you explain the difference to me? Yeah. So notebooks, I think just have, and I, I, so I don't use our notebooks that often. So this is take, take what I'm explaining with a grain of salt, but I think it just gives you an option to um, more interactively see what's in your document as you go along. And our mark, regular R markdown documents can be treat it as our notebooks and vice versa. So you can go back through, but I think it just creates a way for you to see um, more easily what the output of different code chunks are. So you can think of it kind of as a more interim document. Um, whereas I actually don't like to, I like to kind of have those processes separate and toggle that when I want to. So I, I generally just default to an R Markdown document, um, but I believe in tools somewhere and I can link to some resources about the differences in between notebooks too um, from people that know more about them than I do. Uh, but you can you can toggle how much you want to see when you're working in your R markdown document. But that's that's generally the difference between a notebook and just standard R markdown is seeing the results kind of as you go. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, right. Jupyter notebooks is kind of the same idea, but but they are interchangeable. So, like I said, any R Markdown document can be treated as a notebook as well. Okay, so we created our first R Markdown document. Uh, so now we'll go over the bones of what what's in here and what we did, um, and make some changes to it. Okay, so there are some uh, essential components to any document, any R Markdown document that you're going to create. Um, I alluded to this thing called YAML. This is metadata that's going to appear at the top of your document. Um, there are R code chunks, which is basically where your R code is going. Um, there can be as many or as few chunks as you want within any given document. Uh, there's going to be just plain text that's written in just plain Markdown syntax. And then uh, you can set some special options for your R code um, chunks um, using some special syntax as well. So we're gonna talk about each of these pieces. So first we'll talk more about YAML. So this uh, rhymes with camel. Uh, it stands for, well, it's questionable exactly what it stands for, but potentially what I think people refer to as a uh, very meta YAML eight markup language. So it's sort of the specialized uh, form code format that appears at the beginning of your document and it's a header 
that has a very specific um, syntax and specification that tell is going to tell our markdown how to generate the document. So what the steps are when it's compiling. So um, indentation, white space is all going to be really important, which is part of the reason I just like creating it right at the beginning with that default document, because um, I always mess up the indentation somehow. But uh, you don't need very much in your YAML to generate a document. So you can use more and more complex YAML code to create more um, uh, specifications for your, for your output document. But it, essentially, this is what's allowing you to get from our markdown, uh, be processed by Knitter. It gets turned into a markdown document first. Then it gets uh, sourced through this other tool that we're not going to talk about called Pandoc, which is really powerful. And then it goes into the final form, your output um, document. And so it's in the YAML that you can specify, do I want my output to be HTML? Do I want it to be PDF? Do I want it to be a Word document? Do I want it to be slides? All of that is getting specified in YAML. So this is what sort of the most basic YAML will look like. And this is what we had pretty much in our the R Markdown document that we just made, where we give it a title, uh, author has a date and we specify the output for us, we did uh, HTML. But that's that's all you need right as we just saw, but you can get a lot more complicated so here's one for uh, like a manuscript that I have. Um, so you're specifying the title, you can specify author, you can um, be more specific in how you're specifying the date, so it's actually linked to the, the date and time that you're compiling. Um, there's a lot more you can do with outputs. For example, if you're, I write a lot of my, um, my manuscripts in, well, I write all my manuscripts in our markdown and I, um, and I'll output to Word because my collaborators like Word. And so you can feed a custom like doc file as this is, these are, this is how I want you to render this Word document. So you can do stuff like that. Um, this is a package for allowing uh, track changes in Word to go back and forth. Um, you can specify a bibliography and how you want your um, references to be formatted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Can we make the changes in the source window uh, in the YAML metadata? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. So in the, you can, you can make changes to this uh, and save them if you want to play around with it. Is that the question, Sumit? Yes, yeah. So if we have already put in the title and the author earlier, but if we want to change it now, can we do that? Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so if I want my last name, for example, I could do that, just save, and then I would knit again. Um, just for those of you who are on a Mac, the hotkeys for knitting are uh, Command Shift K. And so the output won't be updated until you knit it again, but yes, you change it directly in the source document, exactly. Good question. And you can continue to add things. So like what we have here, um, you would add that right in, you would sort of scale up your YAML as you go. So we're not really going to go into depth with what you can do with YAML, but I just want you to know that um, sky is kind of the limit here. So specifically, uh, if you're using our markdown, for example, to write a dissertation, you can get really, um, really fancy with your YAML, integrating even elements of LaTeX um, to, to create really, really, really nicely styled PDF documents, for example. Great, on a PC, control shift K, makes, makes sense, makes sense. Yeah, it's, it's the hot key of interest today for knitting. Uh, yeah, so I've included some links in the slides that uh, we'll send out afterwards about some of these different options for your YAML for the different outputs you may want to produce. Okay, so that was our YAML. Uh, next, we're going to talk about code chunks. So this is the R component of R Markdown. So when you're writing an R, when you just are using um, like a regular R file, so .R would be the extension, you, you're not thinking of things in terms of chunks because everything is R. If you don't want R to process something, you need to comment it out, right? Um, whereas with our markdown, the default text is going to be treated as markdown syntax, as, as text. And so when you want uh, it to register something as R code, you need to do one of two things. One is, I well, one of two things. So the first would be to use R code chunks where you're specifying basically a block in your document where some R code is gonna go. 
Um, and R markdown will know to treat that as our code when it compiles the document. The other way that we'll learn in a little bit is you can refer to um, objects in R using inline R code, which is another kind of special syntax, kind of like mini chunks within the written prose of your document. Uh, so chunks um, have a special header before the R code, and they are going to look like this. I'll show you, well, actually I'll show you in our, in our document here. So this is a chunk. Let's look at a really simple chunk here. So this is a chunk. It starts with three back ticks. So these aren't single quotes, these are back ticks. Uh, and then curly brackets always has to say R to specify this is the R language that you're including in the chunk. And in this case, this one has a label that the is default, but we could give this any label. It's just a sort of a tag for us. And then there's uh, a number of other options that you can specify in these curly brackets to tell R Markdown what to do with this chunk. But then in the chunk itself is some R code. So in this case, uh, cars is a package, uh, like a data package. And this is just giving a summary of that. If I were to run this chunk, if you place your cursor right in the chunk on the line that you wanna run, you can run it just like you would um, regular R code. But it's not uh, what you're doing in the console is going to be separate from when you actually compile the document. So it's assuming that when you press init, it's starting from, from a fresh slate. So you just have to be cognizant that the R code that you're, that you're including makes sense in the context and in the order that it's arranged in the document. Um, so that's what it prints is just the summary of this cars data set. But then if we go to our output, we can see that that's also what got printed in our output, right? So it specifically showed us the code line that was included and the output of that call. Sorry to interrupt again. I'm actually going mm -hmm. a bit back in time. There was a question that we missed, which was, can you save a YAML script somewhere for future use? Yeah, there are ways that you can pipe in YAML um, from like a external file. Uh, and I have some examples of that, not in this presentation, but I can point to some more examples of that um, because that's that's how a lot of these uh, like larger projects like dissertations and books that use our markdown um, are working from, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, like I said, so you can specify options um, we'll talk about the options in a second, but what I want us to do first is just create a new chunk. So let's say we want to, in that document that we created, we just want to include a code chunk that assigns some random variable X, the value of 10. This is what we're going to do. Uh, you can, you can literally just type out three back ticks, curly brackets, R, et cetera, but that gets, that gets messy really quick. So the easier way to do it is to do, um, uh, alt or option uh, plus command and then I. So control, alt control on a PC, alt command on a Mac plus I, that's the hotkey uh, to insert a chunk. But you can also go to code insert chunk from the R Studio menu. So let's do that together. So I'll just put one, just going to create some space under this, um, the first code chunk that we looked at. See. Oh, I never actually use the and this has moved around code. Oh yeah, okay. So you can go right up here. Uh, so code and then insert chunk. We'll insert a blank chunk. And then same thing for me, option command I will insert another blank chunk. So let's create a new chunk, however you choose to do it. And uh, we'll assign X the value of 10. So um you can also use the equals sign instead of the assignment arrow if you prefer. And then if we run this. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Sorry. What was the, um, the keypad shortcut for, for Windows? Because I will admit that I've just been making three ticks my whole life. And I'm just wondering what the shortcut is. <laughs> <laughs> so I think on a PC, it's, uh, is it option or alt? Command. Control, alt, I. Control, alt, I. Control, alt, I. Control, alt, I. OK, on a PC, control, alt, I. Thank you very much. <laughs> And you can always, so if you are find yourself like clicking things in the menus, it'll tell you what the hotkeys are um, to the right of some menu options too, where they exist. All right, so if we assign X, 
Uh, let's see. Let's now give it a label. So I'm just going to call it my chunk. So right next to the R tag, we're going to give it a space and just say my chunk. Something to make note of that I learned the hard way after bashing my head many times, chunk labels can't contain underscores um, or special characters or spaces. Um, underscores are usually a safe bet for delimiters, but in R chunk labels, you can't use underscores. So hyphens are going to be the way to go or camel case. Um, but whatever you choose, just give it a label. And we're going to uh, give it a special option. So when you give um, chunks options, there's a limited set. There's quite a few options that you can that you can assign, but there but it, there is a limited set of what you can do. And again, these kind of have a special syntax. But generally, it's expecting the R tag, the label if you have it, comma, and then each option separated by a comma that comes of the form um, option equals value. So in this case, we're going to set our option echo to false, which means uh, we don't want it to show the code in the output. So I'll just tell you right now that uh, we have we haven't looked at the special code yet, the special code chunk, code chunk, but in this default document, echo by default is set to true. So we're going to, in this chunk, turn it off. So comma echo equals false in all capital letters. Um, and then we're going to compile our document again. And we really shouldn't see anything because all it's done is assigned a value to the variable x. So we see the output of our summary chunk here, cars, and then nothing here. But if I deleted or if I turned that option to true and recompile it, now we see that that code shows up. If I wanted it to actually print the value of X, I'm gonna just show you here. So I'm gonna turn it back to echo is false because all we did before was just assign a value to a variable. But here I'm actually telling, if I ran this whole R code, it would actually print 10 to the console, right? So if I want it to print to my summary document, um, even though echo is set to false, so it's not gonna show me the code, but it should show me the value that's stored in X. So we'll do that. And it shows me the output that gets printed in the, the console here. Thea? Yes. Um, what's the value in naming your chunks? Because I'll admit that I've used up and down for a long time, but I don't normally name my chunks. Um, am I missing a trick by not naming them? or? or? So I usually don't name my chunks either. I name, when I'm writing a manuscript, I name my chunks that contain objects that I want to refer to usually figures and tables I will name and the reason for that is because there's additional syntax you can learn later on for referring to um, figures and tables that necessitate you calling the R chunk itself so in that case it needs a label um, a lot of people do consider that naming naming your chunks is sort of best practice and I'll tell you why that is is because you can see the mm -hmm. Uh, if you click down here, it sort of tells you what the breakdown of your R Markdown document is. And so if you have unlabeled chunks, you know, you just aren't going to know what's in those unless you're very familiar. This is also a feature kind of related to that. So I use, um, I really like that R Markdown has um, an outline feature that you can toggle sort of in the right hand corner of your source panel here. And so this corresponds to your headers. Right, so this is a second level header. We'll talk about that in a second. And that's really nifty for navigating, but naming your chunks allows you to more easily navigate to your R code. But like I said, it's a preference thing. It sort of depends on the goal of what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, so navigation is probably the key takeaway. Okay, so we set the echo option. Uh, like I said, there's a ton of other options that you can specify. Um, so I've linked to a cheat sheet here that you can take a look at at some other point in time. Um, if you find yourself um, setting the same options over and over and over again, that's where you can use the special chunk that we'll look at in a little bit to set those default options for your document. 
Uh, yeah, so here are some more options for code chunks um, that you can do use for self learning in a little bit. But here is that special setup code chunk. So um, here we can now recognize that this is the same setup, the same sort of syntax that we saw in the original car, um, code chunk, where we have our backticks, our curly brackets, we're saying this is our code. It has the label setup. There's nothing special about that. That's just what it's called in the default document, but this is nice to include because it's intuitive. Um, and then it has an option saying include equals false. This tells R run this, but um, don't show anything from it. So don't show any output. Don't show messages, don't show warnings, don't show the output, but run it in the background. If you want um, R to completely skip over your code, act as if it doesn't even exist, which is really useful when you're running into bugs, uh, that would be eval, which stands for evaluate. But include equals false says run it, but don't show me anything. And now this is special syntax. So this is saying, okay, take the knitter package, which is the, again, sort of the engine for all of the R markdown stuff that we're doing. Call this special, um, oops. Actually, we'll go right to the slide. Um, call this special uh, function that's going to set the options for your chunk. And specifically, we're going to set them. And then within the parentheses here, you can set the default options that you want. So here we have set the default for the behavior of echo to be true. And so it will only be false in later code chunks if we specifically set that option in that code chunk. Okay. So we can just take a look at that and just see that is indeed what's here. I'll show you what it'll look like. I'll just set the default behavior to false, recompile. And you can see it just kind of cleans things up. So it shows the output, but it doesn't show any of the code itself. But we'll reset that to true just for the sake of practice. Okay, so next, um, Markdown itself. So again, there's a lot to learn about Markdown, but the nice thing is that um, its main feature is that it is in fact easy to read, relatively easy to write, uh, and relatively easy to learn. But it, it basically refers to the set of conventions. See, can the chunks take input after knitting? Um, so after knitting, yeah, so you can always go back to your, um, to your R markdown file and add more to your chunk. So for example, I could set this to five, just recompile it and it will it will update with whatever's in the chunk. So the chunks are not set in stone. This is a living, it's helpful to think of R markdown as a living kind of document. You can always go back and edit it and it's not going to update the output until you knit, until you do that knitting step. Right, I'm sorry. Uh, so my question actually is that after you have knit, so when it comes to this browser window, Mm -hmm. uh, can you can you have it dynamic so that it can take user input from here and then calculate it? Yeah, so there are other tools that allow for that. So Shiny is a way that combines our markdown with user input, for example. Um, that's beyond the scope of today, but okay. our, our Shiny would be the tool to look for with that. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. It's but, awesome. but in general, in general, it is static. Right? right. In general, the output document is static. That's correct. Got it. Got it. Thank you. For sure. Uh, okay, so we're going to learn about some of these conventions, but basically the goal with our markdown and using markdown syntax is just to be able to write as you would with a regular text processor, but not have to worry about all the GUI features of um, like stylizing, because you can stylize very simply just by adding these different tags. So again, this is just a super um, brief cheat sheet, but this is this is pretty much all you need to know for right now. And I would argue you don't even need to know all of this for what we're doing. You only need to know a little bit. So if you just want regular old plain text, you type it as is. Um, if you want uh, a line break, um, then you end uh, your line either with two spaces or what I'll usually do is add a blank line in between and that'll create a line break in your text. Uh, italics and bold, you can write in a few different ways. I usually use asterisk, asterisks, which I can never pronounce, but I can type. So uh, for italics, you just enclose whatever you want to type in a single asterisk. For bold, double asterisk. And if you want bold and italics, it would be triple asterisk. Uh, yes, we'll print plots and results without the code in a little bit. Um, so that's some of the stylistic stuff. 
Uh, headers, like what we saw, are um, demarcated by uh, the number of hash marks at the beginning. So a uh, level one header, your most top header, header is just a single hash mark. Um, and the more hash marks you add, the lower your level becomes. Um, and so I've included a link for another cheat sheet here. But again, like I said, that's pretty much all we need to know for now. So um, you can kind of go down as many rabbit holes as you want when you're doing your own writing. But I'll show you um, just really quick. What a so we're starting with a second level header. Could start with a first level header. It just prints out huge text. So that's not the default here. Kind of treats it as another title. But I'm going to add a third level uh, header saying another or a subheader. And it shows right up on my um, outline, which is really neat. And then when we knit it, it shows up. Uh, and there, again, there are ways to specify how these headers appear, but the default is just for it to appear as a slightly smaller font because it's a sublevel header. Okay. Uh, tables can be written in Markdown. They have a very specific syntax. Tables, I'll give you, um, this is a preview. This is, this is a source of a lot of angst for me is table syntax in our Markdown. There are ways to make beautiful tables. There are also very, very, very many rabbit holes that you can go down with table styles. Um, something that's really nice about the new RStudio version that I have a slide on at the end. I'm not choosing to focus on it because I think getting the basics down, understanding the basics are are sort of best practice, but there's actually now a feature that allows you to input tables from like a visual editor in RStudio. But basically, if you want to include a table in Markdown, oops, um, it's going to uh, look like this. So you have different columns separated by these pipes, and you have uh, your headers separated by um, hyphens, by dashes, and then your cells are just separate lines within that matrix style. So I've uh, given a link to a couple of different resources for creating nice tables. This is assuming that you're just creating a table in Markdown syntax. Of course, a lot of the time what we want to do is create tables based on our data. And that's going to be much easier, actually, because you can basically just say, here's the data. Like, it's already in this matrix format or this data frame format, and I want to turn it into a table. And that's actually a lot easier. So we'll, we can see how to do that. Um, for doing that, there's a couple of packages that are really powerful for transforming data into, into tables. So if you're interested in, in learning more about that, look up uh, the cable package if you're outputting to um, PDF or HTML. Like, like I said, I, I output to Word a lot because of my collaborators. And so Flextable is something that winds up being really, really useful if you output to Word a lot. This is another sort of source of angst sometimes is if you just have one output format that you're going with, that's great, easy peasy pie. But as soon as you're trying to navigate between like Word and anything else, it becomes a little bit tricky. Um, and PDF output also has like a deeper dive you can go down. Um, so just be cognizant that while most things will run nicely in output A, B, and C, that's not always going to be the case. Um, so tables, tables just is just a deep dark hole where I found out that was very much not the case always. But there's lots of tools to help with that. Um, okay, so we, we have seen regular markdown text, we have seen code chunks, we have seen that special option setting code chunk, we have seen YAML. So the other way I mentioned that you can refer to R code in your R markdown document is with inline R code or kind of like mini chunks. So um, the syntax for this is a single backtick R, whatever the R code is that you want to include, and then close with another single backtick. So for example, um, in a chunk, we assigned x equals something. Uh, we did x equals 10. If we want to um, include the value in our inline R code, which becomes really useful if we want to incorporate that directly into a sentence that we're writing, then it would look like this. So this is regular text. The value of x is, and then we create that little inline R code, and that will output whatever the value of x is. So we can do this together um, in our script. So I'm going to just have my chunk uh, assign x the value of 5, and I'm going to say the value of x is. So again, you can do backtick r space backtick and just make sure you do your r code right in that space. The hot key for this, uh, I don't know if this is a default. So something else to look up, and I'll include a link to this too. Um, 
is something called snippets. So like autocomplete functions in R Markdown. So for me, if I type R and I hold down shift and press tab, it auto-completes, um, this is, this is auto-completing a snippet. So that becomes really useful. Um, and you can define your own snippet. So I, for example, when I wanna refer to like stats, like model results, I have a snippet that I've defined. I do the same thing and it creates a way for me to really quickly refer to, um, in this case, it's referring to uh, regression model estimates and uh, p-values. So that's just preview of why that becomes really useful. Oh, okay, yeah, so the snippets um, might not be, I, and I honestly, I might have customized my snippet to do that for R, I can't remember at this point. Um, but again, I'll, I'll include a link to snippets and how valuable those can be. But for this, you can, um, you can also, since it's quite minimal text, just that uh, single backtick for now will do. Okay, and then outside of the single ticks, you can keep typing text. So now we will compile again. Yes, please for snippets. Yeah, snippets are amazing. Snippets was another uh, life-changing moment for me. Okay, oh, look, yes, indeed the value of X is five. And notice we had turned our chunk option, again, echo false. So all it tells us is that the value of X is five. Um, if I reassign it later on, or even in the same chunk or even in a later chunk, just to show, and I'm not even gonna label this chunk, X is equal to 10 and I recompile it's going to give you whatever the most recent assignment is. So again, just a caveat, be aware of where your code lives in your R Markdown document because it is rendering it in order. Okay, so now we're gonna um, scale some stuff up. So take that R, R Markdown document that we've been working on and I want you to now just delete everything after that setup code chunk. So I think that's for everybody should be after line 12 and just mess around in it. So add a new header, add some plain text, add some bold text, um, add that, add a new code chunk that assigns X a value, um, get it to print X, add that inline R code and then uh, knit. So basically all that we've been doing, but just let's start a little bit more from scratch. So I'll do this alongside. So I'm deleting everything after, I'm gonna delete from line 12 all the way down to the bottom. Uh, this is a header. This is some regular text. And this is some bold text. This is a typo. Uh, line break. This is italic, hopefully. And then I'm gonna do an arc chunk. Uh, and I'm going to say, X is equal to some key smash. Uh, and I want it to print X. This is just gonna get it to print. I'm not reassigning the option. So it is gonna, it should print the code itself and everything. And then the value of X is X. And then Oh, nice. And it gave me scientific notation. Yes, I see a hand. Caitlin? How do you escape characters in Markdown? So if I wanted my like knitted document to tell me about, so if like I wanted to say, oh, you use stars to make bold text, but I don't want my stars to actually make the text bold. How do I do that? Because I tried the backslash like I would in LaTeX and it did not like it at all. <laughs> yeah, so I think it depends. It normally would be a backslash. Let's see. What does this? Bring? It was because I was backslash. I was backslashing the the tick, and it wasn't a fan. Let's see. So it normally would be a backslash, but it's going to depend on the characters. And I know specifically when you want to include like verbatim R code, that's a whole messy syntax, actually. So oh, there's a bit, maybe it was because it was I was trying to escape the, the ticks rather than like a star or something. Yeah, and actually, I think okay. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Yeah, so it's it it specific to right to tech. Um, so something else you can do uh, sometimes is like print it within the context of um, uh, what would this be called? Like quoted text. So I don't think this will work exactly, but let's try. So this caret is going to treat um, the text differently as well. Although I don't think this is 
going to do what I want. No. So that that wasn't an answer. So I don't know the answer. Okay. So the escape the slash six escape works generally just not for the six. Exactly. Exactly. No problem. Uh, well, let's see. So let's just see what it would look like if I accidentally called the wrong variable that didn't exist, just so we can run into some errors and diagnose them. So it's not going to compile if it can't if it can't process your R code when you're trying to do it. It's going, which is what it's doing here. It's run into R code that it can't run. It's going to give you an error that looks like this. Um, you can usually uh, figure out exactly where it is. It'll tell you more or less where in your code it, it's occurring. If you go to the ish, uh, the output tab of the error panel, our markdown panel here. Um, but basically, it'll give you an R error that you're um, similar to those that you're used to seeing. So here, it's just because I've tried to refer to a variable that doesn't exist. Um, so when that happens, debugging can be kind of um, tricky. But again, if you're creating your R code stepwise, as you would normally, making sure your code runs, then this, this process gets a little bit um, smoother. But it won't update your output file. Um, so what I normally do is I, uh, when I'm working on a new set of data or, or some new question that I have, uh, I do a lot of my data cleaning and exploration in just a regular R script. And then I usually label that something like helper.r. I usually use the same name um, just within, and this is why I like projects again, because it allows me to be pretty systematic with my uh, file names um, and how I'm, uh, how I'm storing them all together. But then what I do is I source my helper file in my R markdown document. And I use code chunks to refer to the variables that I set up in my R script. So I'm still knitting, I'm still using that same underlying um, process, but I can do a lot more like messy coding in my R script um, and only refer to what I feel is useful uh, to keep things nice and neat and tidy in the R markdown document itself. Um, when I'm writing a manuscript, for example, this is usually all of my analyses are in some kind of helper.r or um, often I'll break it down into like data cleaning and modeling and um, those are usually my go-tos for, for how I modulate my, uh, my helper R's. Um, but then in the R Markdown document, I'm mostly just creating fig like nice publication quality figures in the document or sort of revising the tables, but I keep most of the messy analyses delegated to the R scripts. So we're gonna try this. Uh, so now we can use that uh, simulated data set. This is just a, a data set that's part of a really, really, really nice um, publication that shows um, how you can visualize um, mixed effects data. And so they use the simulated VOT data set that has um, like fake VOT values from a number of speakers in both fast and slow speaking conditions. So it's a very simple data set, but it's nice. Um, it's a nice accompaniment to this paper that I've linked to in these slides as well. But we're just going to use the data to make sure that we can read stuff in and source this R code together. Um, so what I would like you to do now is just make sure that simulated VOT data.csv is in your project folder. We'll go back to our studio, create a new R script, and uh, we're going to um, run some code together. So let's do this now. So we're going to create a new script. So this is R script, not R markdown. Um, and we are going to, and I'm going to pull up the one that we have here so you can see along. Okay. So the helper answers.r is just a lot of additional code. We don't need all of this. But specifically, uh, what I'll have you add to yours is just the libraries that we need, um, which you would also want to be careful to include. If you're not using a helper file, you need to also include the libraries that you want to use when you render the document somewhere in your R 
markdown code as well. But we're we're going to start just with this R script. So we're going to use the tidyverse library, which has a whole bunch of useful tools. And then um, because we're using an R project, our working directory is set by default to wherever the R project file lives. So we don't have to do any additional working directory finagling. Um, and if we were to like send this folder to somebody else and they opened up our R project, they would also be able to use the same directory structure that we use because it packages that all together, which is another reason our projects are really useful. So we're going to use this read CSV function. I'm just gonna copy and paste this here. Uh, so we're reading CSV. This is just in base R um, in double quotes our simulated BOT data.csv. And we'll run this as we go. So now we're running within just a regular old R script. I'm going to save this and I'm going to name it helper.r. Okay, so I ran it, it got read in. I'm just going to look at the data. So summary VOT. So this just shows me there's uh, there's four variables. So there's four columns: VOT, participant, item, and condition. Um, we can get the mean VOT by doing using the mean function. This is not obviously a workshop on using R itself, but we're just going to use some basic functions here so we can get the mean uh, value of VOT across the entire data set. It's in milliseconds, so it's uh, 30 milliseconds. We can get a histogram, VOT, VOT. And that prints to our plots panel. But basically we're doing a whole bunch of stuff. So we can do whatever we wanna do to do our data exploration on this data set in our R file, but then we're going to source that into our our markdown file in just a moment. So I'm going to go back to our slides here. So first of all, let's just make sure everybody can um, run some basic code, mainly just can you read in the VOT CSV file? Nods, we're good. Okay, great. Yeah, so if we run that and we save it, now we'll go back to our, our markdown file assuming we've done whatever it is we want to do here. And uh, I'm going to add a chunk. Let's see, do I have you adding a chunk? Yeah, I'm going to add a separate chunk that's going to do this. So I'm going to name it my source helper chunk. Um, and the function is source. And then again, assuming this R file is in your project directory, it's just source the file that you want. So I'm going to delete my, well, I'll leave it there for now, actually. Uh, so I'm creating a new chunk, calling it source helper, source helper .r. First of all, we'll just see if that'll run. Since we have echo set to true, it may print out some information about um, like the tidyverse loading. Yeah, so this is our um, this is our output right now. So it, it's printed everything that would have printed to the console when I ran helper.r. So if I don't actually want it, if I was just doing my data exploration, um, then there's a few things I can do. So one is it's going to print this figure. So I'm just going to comment that out and recompile. And now it's gone. So that's good. It just gives me the, the output from the library. If I want to suppress the the messages here, I'm going to set um, messages, message to false and warning to false. And that auto notice that um, tab completes for me as well. So when I started typing one of the options, it knows what to look for. So I just want to suppress all of that. You can see now it's taking a little bit longer to compile because we're sourcing another R document. So it's going to, that's going to add computational time. Um, if you start doing like more complex analyses, the right path is probably going to be to save your workspace to an R data file um, and then source that or load in the R data rather than the R script itself. But that's another step. So it really depends on your goals and how um, complex your, your output document is. But that's another option is R data as a way to save some of that some of that compiling time. Okay, so this is our current output. I 
uh, well, actually, we'll do this first. So within our, our chunk, we're going to um, get the min VOT and the max VOT from the data set that we loaded in. So since we're not saving these variables, these should just print right to the screen or right to our output. And since we have echo set to true, we can see exactly where that's occurring, right? So um, negative 15 milliseconds and 64 milliseconds. In my R file, I'm going to um, assign, I'm going to say VOT M is equal to mean VOT. And I have to make sure that I save that. I'm not going to run it because it's separate. What I'm doing running things in the console is separate than what R markdown is doing. There's, it's nice for me to run it so I know what my code's doing but it doesn't care whether I've run this code before. It's just taking, it's, it's going to do, to run my R code from start to finish. So I've um, assigned this new variable, VOTM set to the mean, and I'm going to use some inline R text here to refer to that. So the mean VOT value is uh, VOTM. And we know, cause we ran that earlier that it's 30, but let's just see what prints out. So there it links right to it, um, right from your helper file. So you can see how this can wind up being more and more and more and more useful the more um, analyses you're planning on doing. But you can keep your R markdown document nice and tidy and only refer to the values that you that you want to refer to. So you can see um, from the helper answers file and this was so the helper answers was building on we did a lot more sort of basic syntax at a workshop that i gave so there's a lot of different examples of stuff there's a lot of comments um but if you source this document for example there's a lot of a lot of different things going on but you only need to pull those things that you're most interested in showing in your summary document in the r markdown file so again it's just a nice way to kind of keep things modular in a way that's still really systematic and accessible All right. So we did this, we added some inline R code, we can add some more if we want, but for time, I'm just gonna, um, you, you get the picture now from that of the use of inline R code. So now we'll add um, another code chunk that's going to include uh, a figure. So we can add another chunk, name it whatever you want, and then we'll just use the histogram function. If you're a ggplot fan, you can do ggplot instead, um, up to you. But let's include a figure now in our R markdown file. So there's just a quick question. Someone yeah. is asking what will make R markdown run faster, having the data code in the R chunk or having separate R files for the chunks? That's a good question. And I don't actually know. Um, I think what I think the processing is probably similar. But if you're if you're running like if you're including R chunks that you would include in the R code anyways, then they're probably pretty similar. One of the benefits, I guess, is you can include a lot more R code than you would want to include in the code chunks. And so um, whether that makes it faster, though, I'm not sure. When it gets to more than like a few seconds to compile, that's where I'll wind up using R data files um, to cut down on that. But I'm, I, I think probably sourcing the R code just based on my experience feels faster. I don't know whether it is, but it feels faster. But that could be my imagination. Can you source another R markdown file? Yeah, so you can you can source another R markdown file. Um, that's something you can do. You can also use child documents, which are special. Um, uh, like it's a, it's a special chunk option that basically says, so this is something I would do. I'm not going to go into this in too much depth because I actually have another workshop that I've linked to in these slides on dissertating in R. And that goes through the whole process of how to, um, if you want to sort of create an interim summary. So if you have a lot of different R markdown documents that are talking about different parts of your code or different chapters, for example, and you want to show a couple of those chapters at once, then you can use child documents to like embed different R markdown outputs into one without having to compile all of them together. But there's another tool called Bookdown that allows you to really skillful, not well skillfully, but it allows you to really um, uh, have a lot of different R markdown files that you do compile together in a final book output. And so that's the kind of thing that's useful for a dissertation. Um, 
Yeah, so using an R data file. So let's say we are running a new session. I'm just gonna, well, we'll just keep what it is. So let's say we wanna save what we've done so far. So we want to save um, our, the objects that we've created. Um, and I do actually, let's say I went through, I ran this whole code. And so now everything in my environment is what I have run in that code. Yeah, VOTM is just, uh, we've created that VOTM as the variable containing our mean VOT. Um, so now, let me look this up because I always have to look it up afterwards, but I think it's um, save image. And then we can save our file as, um, a uh, helper and I usually date my R data files because I can I can then update them based on what I was doing. So we'll say today is 2021 03 and you have to append it with the suffix dot R data. You can also save individual objects that would be save RDS. Um, but a, this is saving our entire environment. So every all of our objects, our entire environment is getting saved. And now that should appear in our files. So now we have this new file of this R data file. And now if instead of sourcing a helper, I wanted to, I think it's load, uh, and then the name helper 2021.03.9.r data. So now this is going to load our environment in, and this winds up being Faster. I don't know if it's going to look faster here because we don't have a lot going on in that script, but this should allow us to still pull from everything that was in our environment in the same way. So let's compile that. Yeah, so same idea. Uh, probably was a little faster. I'm not sure. But when you have complex models, anything that takes a lot of time, that's the, that's the route to go, I think. But for all intents and purposes right now, these two lines of code are achieving the same thing for us. Okay, right, so we're gonna make our figure. So down at the bottom, I'm just gonna create another header called data viz. And I'm going to create another R chunk. I'm just gonna give myself some space. VOT distribution is what I'm gonna call it. Not gonna give it any different options. Histogram, uh, VOT, VOT. And there it prints right down here. Uh, so if we want to um, have it included but not actually print any of the code, then we could do, um, I think include, well, we'll say echo equals false for now. Can we use all the cores for computation here? I'm not sure about the answer to that, Sumit, sorry. Um, there's a lot- I think you're missing a comma after what this before echo equals false. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so now we've just got our plot. If I wanted to give it a figure caption and I'm outputting to, um, HTML or PDF, then you can do another option. And again, tab completion is really helpful. So fig cap, my, my figure caption, and that'll print a little caption. And there are ways to, so now we've got a little caption down here. If we wanted to refer to um, our figure earlier on, the default output, our default HTML output is not going to allow us to do that, but there's another um, kind of output that we can use that's basically just a layer on. Um, I have some links to that, so we can sort of choose what we want to do. Let's get through just a few more things on our slide, but if we want to look at that together, we can. Uh, I'm just going to show you some of the final pieces that I want you to be aware of, and then we can sort of choose what to do with the last little bit of our time. So. Uh, like I said, the usefulness of this 
is, is going to really grow exponentially as your project complexity increases. So a few of the other ways, so as soon as you're like reporting multiple figures, you're reporting summary variables, you're reporting um, tables and, and, and statistics within your documents itself, that's where R Markdown is really gonna start shining. So these are all the ways that I'm using R Markdown right now. Like I said, my manuscripts, um, my dissertation was written in R Markdown and Bookdown. Um, this presentation, like I said, uh, any kind of presentation where I need to show code um, or just really want to give like a quick and dirty, like these are the results, here are tables and figures without doing a whole lot of markup. Um, I'll, I'll use R Markdown for that kind of presentation. Anything where I really like being super controlling of exactly where my little figures are going, I still use PowerPoint for that kind of stuff. But this kind of thing I use R Markdown for. Um, summary documents, uh, I use R Markdown as like a, project folder so as a way to navigate again in combination with book down and i'll show you an example of what that looks like i'm also using it for my my personal website and my lab website in combination with a tool called blog down so blog down and r markdown allows you to create dynamic websites um, i'm now sort of updating it to uh to rewrite my my cv um using it in a whole slew of different ways really but it's really 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 quite powerful so here's uh, just an example of uh, what a manuscript would look like. And I'll just show you this. Well, I'll show you the, the snapshots and then we can kind of decide if you wanna go into more some of these documents and see what they'd look like or if you wanna do some more troubleshooting. So this, um, this is like part of a manuscript that we are drafting right now. Um, so this is the direct output. Uh, you can't see it because the figure is really small, but there's a ton of inline stats here and all of that goes back to the manuscript. And the reason that, so I caught a bug in my code recently for something that I had already, like that was in revision. Um, and I was able to see exactly what went wrong, like why the number didn't make sense because I had it in my R code in the R Markdown document. So I could exactly go back um, and see what happened and fix it um, without kind of wondering where I had copy and pasted some number from my data from. Here is an example of the way that I used R Markdown for um, keeping track of my dissertation. So I wrote my dissertation in R Markdown and Bookdown, but in order to sort of cut my teeth on the tools that I was gonna be using, um, I used an intermediary step where I basically just uh, used R Markdown and Bookdown to keep track of different things that I was learning as I went. So what, what were the steps of my organizational process? Um, what were the steps of different stages of the analysis that I was doing? And here I have, zoom in a little bit. This is what the project folder for that looks like. So it's a bunch of um, R Markdown files, each with their own sets of information. And then I use, um, again, I have sort of a more complicated YAML specification that outputs it to this very, very beautiful format called um, Bookdown that allows me to open it basically as a web page and keep all of that information in a set like this. So that's another um, really handy way to, uh, to, to scale up eventually. Just a reminder of where we're at in our journey here. It's okay to, um, to know that there's all of these rabbit holes we can go down. Um, because the more you know, the more you know you don't know, and that's that's a good thing. Um, but some just basic tips from me, I think, um, based on my own experience with sort of like where to go next with some of this is, I think starting with just using our markdown as a way to kind of tell the story of your data to, to both yourself, as well as anybody who you can share it with in kind of a low stakes environment. So code updates are a great way. Um, any kind of consult you have, like I said, if you're planning on using it for a dissertation or some major time like project on a timeline, just start as early as you can. Um, that's like I said, exactly why I did the record keeping component was just kind of to learn as I go. Cause I, at any point I was like, if this is gonna be too much, I'm just gonna give it all up and go back to what I was originally doing. And that's okay. You know, you can, you can sort of figure things out as you go along, um, but just be prepared to sort of go down the rabbit holes you choose to go down. You don't have to go down every single one. You can do it on a case by case basis. Um, yeah, and just kind of build up. There's there's tons of information online, lots of different templates, lots of different packages that people have written to make writing in R Markdown more accessible. Um, so just kind of pick pick your choose your own adventure and and, and learn bit by bit. I think what you want to build on. Uh, I did want to just show you what I had mentioned a little bit earlier. So there's this really nifty new tool called Visual R Markdown. 
um, that lets you actually see your markdown text rendered. So in our studio, if you go to the top right hand corner and you click this little, I think it's like a clipboard. I'm actually not sure what that is, but um, looks like an A from where I am. And you can see that all of your markdown actually gets rendered in the document itself. And there's like, it looks a lot more like a regular word processor. So there's like a uh, table function. I mentioned tables are kind of a headache. So you can insert table, um, insert code chunks. Everything is just a little bit more sort of uh, graphical interfacey. Um, so that might just be something, again, I think knowing the basics is really, really valuable so that you can debug as you go, but just know that this is a new feature as of this year that can be really powerful for, um, for learning this stuff in tandem. And then I just have uh, a, bunch, a bunch more resources and I'll link to some of the other things too. So specifically, uh, I didn't have snippets on here, but those are pretty popular. And I said, I'll link to um, our R data and RDS options um, and then notebooks as well. And then uh, I'll invite you if you do have any other questions. So again, we can take some time to just kind of play around a little bit more, but um, you should have my, my email. And so and I, can, I can share that if not, but also feel free to reach, reach out anytime if there's stuff directly from this presentation that you're like, I think we covered this and I just wanted to check, but I forget. Um, you're also welcome to do that. But also the online R community is really, really wonderful. Uh, I have far fewer options than you in the menu bar. Like in the R Studio bar, is that what that question is referring to? I think that's an update thing. I updated last before Christmas, and I've got fewer as well. I think. Yeah. So this is like very new. This is very, very, very new. The um, the R Markdown Visual Editor. So this is this is great. Exactly as Sophie said. It's not custom. It's not something you can customize. It's just if when you update your R Studio version, you'll have more options. Right. Okay. Thank you. Great. So that's it for the presentation. So we can kind of choose what we want to do next. If people um, have specific questions or if we want to play around, um, like I said, I can show you uh, how to refer to figures. I can show you some of the other documents, um, but that's, but that's, that's where we'll leave it for now. So what happened is that a lot of super level sets are anchored at a single point. Right, but I oh. <laughs> great. So I see some hands up, and I'm not sure if they're residual hands or if they're questions. But uh, go ahead and just unmute and ask if you want. I do have a question. Um, yeah. So I I think you covered this at the beginning, but I'm not too sure it applies to what I'm I need actually. So um, when you do have a word template, so let's say you do have. Um, I don't know, your organization, institution, university wants you to do things for a specific way. Let's say you want like the key boxes to be in blue or you have like the organization template somewhere in the Word document. How you do, how you create a template like that in our markdown? Um, is it like a package, specific package to do that or? No, so actually if it's Word that you're dealing with and are you specifically referring to Word document outputs? Yeah, well, or, or PDFs, because it's two, it's sort of two separate avenues uh, well to both because i'm not too sure which one actually <laughs> yeah so so with a word document basically what you do is you go into word you create a blank document and you and you manually set the styles that you want so you set your fonts you set your text box options whatever um and that's generally and so i, I don't know how deep you can go with word document customization with that route but like the style pane for for word um is pretty in depth, I think. So that may be enough. And then what you do is you save that blank document with your styles. Mm -hmm. um, as I usually just name mine template, I use kind of the same one. And then in your YAML, you can source, it's, it's not exactly source, but you can point to your template Word document as the style guide that our markdown needs to look at to render as you asked it to. Mm -hmm. So that's one option. Um, for, for PDF, there's a lot more options that are available to you that can be used in the YAML or in this additional um, document that can contain all of your YAML specifications. And that's because you have the power of LaTeX available to you when you're outputting to, um, to PDF. And so for example, there's a lot of templates online for, um, 
for example, APA articles, there's a, a package called, uh, I can never say it, I will link to it, but it's like Papa Ja or Papa. Anyways, it's a, it's a template. It's a package that specifically sets up all of this template for outputting to PDF in a format that follows a exact APA manuscript specifications. So there's a package for that. Um, there's also for dissertations, a lot of different people have uploaded um, sort of the source code for the, the back end of the PDF output for their school's dissertation templates. So I have, uh, I'll just show you one of the links that I have here that I had kind of alluded to. Just while Sia finds that, um, because a lot of you were asking about joining our mailing list. So I think some people find us by Twitter so on our mailing list. Um, I shared a link in the chat to a Qualtrics form. So if you do want to be on our mailing list and you're not already, just in this form we will add you to it. Yeah, so for the dissertation, um, the, the method that I used and the method that a lot of other people have used is to have basically a separate, uh, two separate tech files that you're doing all of your specifications in. So um, you have basically an index R markdown document to get things started. Um, and that's containing whatever YAML you want, but then you also have additional tech um, files that contain uh, everything about the format output that you want it to keep track of. Um, so, so it sort of depends on your goal, what you're choosing to do. But there's, I would say if, if you have sort of like styles that if you know that you need to output to Word and you know that what the style guides are, or maybe you already, maybe somebody already has a template Word document, then you could actually just, it doesn't have to be a blank document, I don't, I don't think, although I might be wrong about that. But basically you could just delete everything and save that document as your style document template and source to that too. So it depends, but there's a lot of different routes to, to doing that. Thank you. Yeah. Great. I, I have, I have a, one question. Yeah. It's, it's regarding, um, figures so mm -hmm. uh, for example when you need to do a lot of histogram plots for a, a lot of variables and for example you use a for function to plot all these histograms mm -hmm. but my, my doubt is um, after you need the plots will you be like one after other without like a line without anything like the, the layout is not so good Mm -hmm. I don't know how to set like, for example, one line between the plots uh, when you use like this structure of like, you would do like a four rule or something like that. Yeah, so again, it sort of depends on your goal, but if you wanted the figures to be, you created them all in this single loop, but you want to refer to them in different places in your document, is that what you're describing? Yeah, or, or, or for example, for just put like a single blank, blank line between among the, the figures, you know? Oh, just the single blank line. Um, yeah. That I imagine you could do like in the for loop itself, but I'm not, I think it would have to do with the figure specifications more than the, um, more than the R markdown rendering component, I think. Mm. Um, so I don't know if that's an R markdown specific query. I'm just trying to think of what the route would be for that. Could you use the for loop to save them rather than to produce them and then just spit them all out? Um, yeah. Maybe. And that would be right, rather than printing to the output. And that's more in line with what I normally do as well as I kind of create all of my figures in one. Well, not necessarily, but that if you're creating a lot of the similar ones where you have this function that's spitting them out, then right, that would be a great way to do it. Okay. You save them and then you can include a separate. So let's say you have a chunk where you create the figures, but you are saving them to their variable names. And then you have another chunk that calls them one after the other or something like that. I, okay. That would be another, yeah. another customizable way to do it. Makes sense. Yeah, or things like patchwork, right? So somebody mentioned patchwork, um, cowplot, like these different packages for arranging plots, which sounds like might be a little bit different than what you have in mind, but, um, but there are lots of packages for arranging your plots in various configurations as well. So patchwork and cow plot are two that I. Thank you. No one like. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, yeah, whoever. H Hello, can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for the presentation. When I saw that it was an introduction, I was like, oh, no, I know Markdown, but no. <laughs> it was very This is useful. what I love thank about you. these things. Oh, good. I'm, I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just had two questions I think I asked you in the chat. The first one was whether uh, I could like prepare a YAML somewhere and, and call on it when I need it. Um, and the second one was the snippets that sounded fascinating. I would love to, you know, have a link to snippets to be able to just use the keyboard and not, you know, yeah. like shortcuts. Yeah. And I'll send, I'll send a couple of resources for the snippets. Um, if you, uh, I think if you Google, if you're, if you're like very keen to look at it right now, just Googling our snippets, um, Mara Abrick oh, okay. has a really great page on it, but I'll send some specific links for how to do that. Um, in terms of the YAML saving it somewhere, so that might, so yes, I, I think short answer is there is a way to do that. I'm not exactly sure how to show it because that's not a process that I use. Um, but where that might sort of line up with what I was talking about earlier is where um, you can you can basically if you're using book down so if you have a large project you can have your yaml all in one code and then you can always refer to that code as your index if you're just using our markdown so book down is to knit together multiple our markdown documents in one output um, I'm surely there's a way to do it I'm not sure what it is off the top of my head Okay, thank you so much. Sure. And then let's see, whoever, uh, Inez, I saw your hand up. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I actually have a question related to the previous one, um, which is also about um, like how plots are organized. Because as, yeah. as far as I understand, every time you need, the R markdown document, it like um, like restart the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have, for, for instance, problems when using uh, this function par and fro two two to organize like four different plots plots all together. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, um, so when I had it in my R script, they, uh, it was okay. When I had it in my R markdown file. Um, it was okay when you run the specific chunk, but then when you need it, then the, the size was completely <laughs> destroyed. Like it had nothing. Oh, the size. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I don't know how how could you like overcome this uh, this thing. Yeah. So there's ways to specify um, figure heights and width. Uh, and again, it's going to depend on your output, but probably one of the easiest ways to do it is just to include um, an option so you can specify like fig width, I think, um, fig height and fig width, you can add those specifications. There's also a package um, that allows you, let's see, it's TJ, Tristan Marr is the author that allows you, I he has a like just a miscellaneous package that allows you to see how you're plot is going to render um, so that you can sort of get a preview of what it will look like in the output beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's just, I think the package is TJ miss and it's uh, GG preview maybe, but I'll, I'll add that to my list of things to share. Um, but that's another way because that, yeah, that can be kind of troublesome um, at times. So using the the chunk options to specify ahead of time and just knowing what that will look like is probably your best bet so that there's a little bit of um, correspondence between what you're what you're asking R to do and what you know you're asking R to do within the um, with during the rendering process. Because it's true, what you're saying is kind of a common source of frustration, I think, is that when you run things in the console, right, in your local mm, environment, yeah. it's mm. you might run into difficulties. Um, or some differences in the output and it can be very difficult to link where those are. So something that I often run into is if I am, um, if I'm sort of forgetting when I have embedded data or embedded R scripts elsewhere, if I'm kind of forgetting where the R project lives in relation to everything else, that can often be a source of frustration for me, specifically when I'm linking to other documents outside of that project folder. 
Mm -hmm. um, but it sounds like for you, when it comes down to the figures, it's, it's more a matter of sort of knowing what the default specifications for the figures are mm -hmm. and trying to account for that um, before rendering. So I think the preview, the, the ggplot preview function might be useful. Um, and also taking a look at these chunk options for specifying figures. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and then you, Lim? Hi, I was a little late, so you might have talked about this, but I have a, an idiosyncratic question, which is, I found that when I run a chunk, um, which lists all my packages, Sometimes it like creates this lethal combination and then it like terminates my session. And then I found that if I run it kind of line by line, which I think defeats the point of like running it in chunks, it's fine. So I, I, I don't know if this is like a common problem or something that I've just done completely wrong. And I like, yeah, I don't know if you have any insights on that. That'd be really helpful if you do. Does that yeah. make sense to my question? Yeah, I think so. Again, I think just starting with whenever you're trying to run and debug your code, starting with a clean session would be my first, which is probably sounds like what you're already trying to do, because this is a problem that I'm sure you've diagnosed, tried to diagnose many times. But if you, um, our markdown is assuming a clean session. So if you have things happening earlier on in your code, or if you're linking lots of code together, um, it may be that something is occurring earlier on or is getting loaded or masked. Masking sometimes happens. I'm not sure why running, if you have a clean session and you're running it line by line, I'm not 100% sure off the top of my head what the problem could be. But I think I run into a similar problem a lot of the kind you're describing with like the order in which I load plier and okay. plier. Okay. Um, and so just kind of trying to, trying to replicate exactly what our markdown's doing um, is probably the best bet. And knowing that our markdown assumes everything is a blank slate. I don't think that really answered your question. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. I might just try then fiddling around with the order so that when it runs a chunk in one go, it's not unhappy with kind of the sequential, like the sequencing of it. Is that? Yeah. Hard? And maybe just starting small. So I know like when you load different packages, it'll tell you what is being masked. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that can be really useful. Uh, like if you're trying to, for example, with the plier dplyr option, um, like dplyr, I think masks filter from base R, for example. Okay. And so then filter won't work if I'm trying to get filter to use the syntax that I associate with dplyr if I've run something that's masked it later on. Um, yeah. So just kind of systematically commenting out your package loading and seeing what breaks when is my best bet, which. Can I ask a quick follow up to this question? Yeah. Um, so like very embarrassingly, I oftentimes have like different scripts open simultaneously from kind of different projects. I don't know if, if that might have like interference with the clean slate nature of our markdown or if it kind of like the autonomy will like prevent cross pollination and thus. Yeah, no, I mean, that's actually a really good question because there is a distinction. So when it, whatever you have open, because I, I, I do the same thing and I often have even in the same, I'll open up scripts from other projects in yeah. the same prod panel because I want to refer to them and see what I did before. So that won't matter. What you have mm -hmm. open won't matter. It's just that if you haven't, so if if the the environment that you're working in when things are working properly in the local environment is different from what you're getting in our markdown, it probably means there's something specified earlier on in the code that you're sourcing or that you're calling in the R markdown file that isn't in the same order that you're doing things like live. Uh, okay. Ah, okay, so I might have uh, like the packages in a certain order, but the way that I then kind of actually use them later on will conflict in some way. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Great. That's probably, probably the source of the frustration. Okay, great. Thanks very much. That's great. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> Great. And Caitlin, your hand's still up, but I know you asked the question earlier, so I don't know if that's still up. It's, it's a new question. Oh, Sorry. great. Okay. <laughs> This is a really specific problem. And so, um, yeah, if anyone's come across this. So I have just realized, I didn't realize our studio had updated. I last updated it in like August, September time. Um, when that update came out, um, and I think that was the one that did strange things with like reading factors and characters, if anyone can mm -hmm. remember that. Um, so, but when the R studio update came out then, I was having a really specific issue with Markdown where um, think, things would work if I knitted, but not if I ran the chunk, you know how you can like play a chunk 
on its own. Um, and it was very specifically with my working directory that I usually have everything in like subfolders. So I'll have my project in a folder and then I'll have the data and images and like whatever in subfolders. Um, and if I knit the whole document, it would be totally fine. But if I were trying like read data in like folder data slash whatever folder, um, sorry, data slash um, path and um, mm. it would work in the knit and not in the chunk. It was like the chunks couldn't inherit the, the working directory. Mm -hmm. um, I asked this on the R Studio community and apparently no one else has had the issue, but also no one else like clearly I'm just the only person who works in chunks <laughs> because they were all like oh yeah this doesn't work and no one knows why and I don't know if anyone else has come across this and either it's gone with the update and so I d it's not a problem anymore or I'm doing something fundamentally wrong with how I work with chunks versus knitting. Um, so does it work so not just when you run the chunk itself but yeah. when you run it line by line within a chunk? Are you replicating the same problem? Yeah, that's totally, no, okay. so the, the, the chunks, are the yeah, so it's basically when, unless I knit, it's like right. run versus knit are doing different things. Yeah. That's kind of the issue. I mean, um, like run can inherit the working directory from the project, whereas knit seems to, knit seems to live in like the subdirectory rather than, no, sorry, ah, I keep getting knit and run the wrong way around. Knit seems to have the right working directory and then run seems like it's living in the directory where the markdown is rather than where the project is. Yeah. Yeah. I so I have run into that kind of that flavor of problem before. Yeah. And it usually has to do with when like I've created a project, but then I've created a subfolder, like I'm testing some stuff out. And so I've created a subfolder to run my R markdown. And so yeah. sometimes what I'll do um is I'll try I'll Usually it's, I think it's the reverse problem for me where I can't, like I'm doing it just fine in then you knit it. and then I knit <laughs> it and it's like, oh, this is, this is not working. So often what I'll do, and this is just a hack, but if I can figure out, okay, where the, where, um, where is the working directory relative to when I'm knitting versus where is it, with whatever yeah. configuration I've gotten myself into in my local um, sort of uh, live working, we'll say. I'll just include another line. So when I'm working, uh, so for example, if helper actually lives outside of my working yeah. directory, I'll just include like another line. Um, like set working directory or something. Yeah, yeah, not even set working directory, but oh, okay, just, I have the one that will knit. Let's and say this is, this is the one <laughs> yeah. that will knit and this is the one that won't knit. And when I'm working, I just run this one and I don't run this chunk. Does that make Looks sense? Looks familiar. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's pretty happy, but sometimes it's just, I don't know what the, like, I think this is where like knowing, like just being, um, trying to work with how projects are working. So there's yeah. actually, so there is another package called, um, called here. That yes, that was one of the possible suggestions people put on the RStudio website. Yeah. Yeah, so that might be worth pursuing if this is something you're kind of continually running into because I don't it doesn't sound like it's a like an R studio bug. It sounds like it's sort of of the same flavor of just project directories and R markdown original location. It's a markdown. Don't bug, always play. <laughs> maybe it's, it's maybe markdown it's, not talking to projects. It's really odd. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. here, here might be a solution to your problem. Otherwise, just hacking having like yeah <laughs> your your nights and your day of your. Okay. Yes, the, the, the knit versus the run options. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, Not the most satisfying answer, but no, it's okay. I'm wondering now, I'm trying to update R and really just to add into the fun, like check up, check for our studio updates menu option is gone. So that's oh, no. super exciting. Um, but um, yeah, if I can update our studio, it's possible that they fixed it. But I'll have yeah, look. yeah. I mean, worth taking a look. It's always kind of a, right, a, a little bit nerve wracking to update our studio if you're in the middle yeah. of a project, but when the characters and factors changed, I had to change every script I own. <laughs> That's <laughs> really That's I know. I know. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, I'll take another look. But yeah. Sure. Thanks. Great. And Ines, did you have another question? Um, yes, actually. Um, I was just wondering uh, the difference about uh, using source and then the R script, um, uh, well, yeah, the R script, or the load, and then the R data. I mean, I, I think I know the difference, I think, but uh, in which cases would be more uh, advisable to do so, to use one or the other? 
Yeah, so what source is doing is it's running the script anew. It's running it from start to finish. Um, if you're sourcing an R script. Load is basically taking the saved objects from the environment that existed at the time that you created the R data file and it's just loading those back in. So it's not running the script. It's just loading everything that was saved previously. So this is kind of like our data allows you to recapture a static point in time, whereas sourcing a script um, allows you to make more, I guess, more dynamic changes. So if you wanted to go back and like change something in your script and then recompile, it would automatically update those. Whereas for the R data, you would have to create, you would have to save a new R data file. So this is more static and this is more dynamic, I guess would be one way to think of it. Um, does that make sense? Uh, yeah, totally. It's actually that uh, I used to have an R script, which had a lot of functions that I, or a lot of things that I kept on changing. Mm -hmm. But one of the variables was a variable that it took like 15 minutes to run or so. So I, of course, didn't want to do it every time, but at the same time, I was changing so much that it was a hassle to ha then have to uh, save everything as R data. So, yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, there is no easy <laughs> solution to that. Yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, the other thing you could look into, so there's two things. Another option that we didn't talk about um, is something like it's caching. So, oops, yeah, oh, it knows what I'm trying to say. Um, so if you aren't updating it that often, but if you have something that's really um, like computationally heavy uh, and it's not changing every time you run the R markdown document, then you can set um, cache to be true and it will basically save some of the information. It'll make the processing a little bit faster provided that things like uh, figures and, and models aren't, um, uh, aren't being updated. But it sounds like what you're doing, you are, you are wanting to do that update in real time. So, I mean, the other thing you could do is just add a line of code whenever you're doing the update where you do refresh the R data. Um, and so, like I said, what I do is, is I normally like date my R data files and I'm, I'm very intentional about when I use these, but, um, but you don't have to do that. If you know you're making regular updates and you'll like, you know, you'll, once you get to a place where you're happy with sort of that static rendering, you can save that somewhere else, or you can, um, if you're, you're, if you're using um, like Git or anything, you know that you can save those snapshots in other ways too. So, so saving our data files or RDS files, which are, so our data is the whole environment, RDS are specific objects. So it sounds like if you just include that into your workflow, that might actually um, help you with some of these issues. Um, sorry, what you suggested also is uh, to write like a line of code in, by the end of my R script, for instance, saying uh, save the image, blah, 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 so that every time I run the script, I will have the newest. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Ah, okay. That's yeah. And then, so, so then if you just had it something more generic, mm. um, then you know that that's just going to be the last time you ran the script mm. start to finish. Yeah. But then uh, RDS files, I think save um, save RDS is the other one. So save RDS is um, where you save a single object. So if we just wanted to save the mean value, um, it would look like that to save. And then that saves an RDS object that we can load in. So if you have like one model that you're running and that's what you want, as opposed to the whole script, you still want to be running the whole script, saving a single mm -hmm. object might be another option. Okay, that's a very smart solution actually. Thank you very much. Our, the R data files saved me a lot of a lot of time and frustration, but it took a while to get to the point where I realized how to use them to my advantage. So <laughs> I hear I hear that. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions or? Musings. All right. Okay. Well, if there are no more questions, first of all, I will thank Thea very, very, very much for her great presentation. Uh, I learned a lot, and I'm sure everybody learned a lot. So it was a very useful and helpful, helpful session. So thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for having me again. It was fun. So yeah. Great. I think, I think nice like a lot of people, I thought I knew a fair bit about our markdown, but you've now 
show me all these wonderful things that I didn't know and that I'm now like, oh, I can use that to make even better things. So thank you all so much. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's a lot, a lot of fun to be able to, to share this stuff. And like I said, I'm a little bit of an R Markdown evangelical these days. Just, just give me a second. Give me a second. 